Hello and welcome. My name is Neil Silcox. I'm the Faculty Excellence Lead with the Maple League. I am speaking to you today from Chibuktuk, Halifax in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'll encourage you to take a moment to share with us in the chat where you're joining from, because I think we have people from across the Atlantic and across the country. I'm really, really excited today to uh, welcome three terrific educators for this session, Educating for Compassionate Communities of Interdependence. Uh, we'll be joined by Mary Sweetman, Gabrielle Donnelly, and John Colton of Acadia University. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I will throw it to you, uh, Gabrielle, John, Mary, to take it away. Thanks, Neil, and, uh, and for the warm welcome. Also, uh, just great to see people logging in here. We know it's a busy time of year as we all uh, navigate on campus life and world and, and courses. And so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as Neil mentioned, my name is Gabrielle Donnelly. I'm with the Department of Community Development at Acadia University. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm here today with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mary Sweetman and Dr. John Colton. And we, uh, we are, I'm, well, I'll be hosting the three of us in a way. So I'm, I'm facilitating this session and also contributing to it. And, uh, and I'm gonna share some slides just to, just to help us ground in some context. Um, so you have a sense of where we are. Um, where we're coming into this today. And as I see things coming into the chat. So the purpose of this session for us today is to explore together ways of educating for compassionate communities of interdependence. Uh, we offered a session, this version of a session, our similar version of this session at the uh, World Community Development Conference uh, virtually this summer, which was located in Kenya. And, and we had some people who chimed in and said, I'm here because I like all of those words, compassionate, communities, interdependence. I don't know what they mean together, but that's why I'm here. Um, and so for us, I think in many ways, this is capturing an inquiry that the three of us have been in with colleagues and students and each other as we think about when we're in classroom spaces and when we're working in community, how can we have more aliveness, more connection, more relationship, uh, and particularly coming out and in this phase of the pandemic, really in a, a deeper inquiry of how we can really create and enliven our spaces in these ways. So, so the three of us have been in conversation and writing and thinking about this. And we also wanna share concrete examples, ideas, practices, um, and to hear from all of you as well, uh, we'll have opportunities for dialogue and engagement as well. Um, and I will have, I think we have students on the call, we have other professors, potentially people who are supporting curriculum design, faculty support administrators, so it's, it's great to have you all here. And so I also want to just add another layer of land acknowledgement. This is one of the incredible views. Um, uh, close to Acadia University. And, and for us in, in the Department of Community Development, it is a daily practice for us. Um, as our new Governor General, Mary Simon said this summer, uh, truth and reconciliation work is a daily practice. And, and this for us is something that we are continually stepping into and turning toward. And so acknowledging that we um, are learning and um, and in this work on the ancestral and contemporary territories of the Mi'kmaq that are unceded and unsurrendered and learning how to be in right relationship and what it means to all be treaty people. Uh, and this inquiry and journey is both simultaneously challenging and deeply nourishing. And so I just wanted to speak that in here too and, and give us a sense of some, some version of this view can be seen out of many window, windows at Acadia University. 
I also want to acknowledge uh, that our work is also situated in an awareness and the context of the 400 year history of communities of African descent in Mi'kmaq. And in particular that the 50 plus historic black communities around the province today. Um, and so all of this is embedded in our inquiry around educating for compassionate communities, which we'll unpack a little bit more here in just a minute. So in terms of the agenda, what you can expect in this next hour, less than now, uh, obviously land acknowledgement, we're in the welcomes and introductions, the framing of this session. We'll just have a quick check-in to get a sense of who's in the room with us, this virtual room today. We'll provide some context around these foundational concepts um, and in particular our program. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of how we're grappling with this in practice. So what are we learning about this? What are we learning about this question as we hold it and as it guides our work? And then we'll open up some opportunity for question and response and wrap up and close and, and get you out of here uh, in time for whatever else you're transitioning to in your day. I know I have a class that's starting at 1.15, so I'll be, I'll be dashing on the other side of this, but really present for the time that I'm here. And also an invitation to participate. I think Neil mentioned it. Uh, we are advocates of the chat. I think uh, uh, it can really democratize space. There is room for everyone. So we invite you to uh, contribute there with your experience, your questions. Um, we love having a vibrant chat. We may, may not be able to get to necessarily all of the comments, but you can respond to each other. And, um, and then for those of you who really just need to also focus on what's happening here and find the chat a distraction, of course, minimize it. But we just want access points for everyone. Uh, and so really, please do bring your insights, make connections with your expertise, your research, your lived experience. Um, and we are really uh, wanting to value and invite multiple ways of knowing into today's session. So just for us to get a sense of who you all are with us today, um, I'm going to drop a link into the chat here. I'll stop sharing for a second. Um, and this will take you to a Mentimeter site. And the question just that we have up there, the first one is, are you a student who's joining us today, a professor, uh, an administrator, uh, faculty, student support, or other? We just want to get a sense of who you all are. And I'm going to share that so you can see it. Great to see, we have quite a nice, oh, we have quite a substantive other. So please uh, chime into the chat. I was trying to think of the different categories uh, today, but we'd love to love to hear who you are. Um, great to see some people who are in uh, curriculum design, um, support roles, administration, uh, professors in the classroom, and then we have a number of students with us and, and shout out to our community development students who are joining us today. And I know there, there are those of you from all years, but also a uh, special hello to those of us, those of you who are our first year students. Um, so it's great to see. So yeah, we're getting quite, quite a mix here. Uh, and the next question just is why, why did you log into today's session? What drew you here? And just a line would be great, just to get a sense of it. You know, it's the third week in September. I think it's the third week in September, kind of keeping track or trying to. Uh, but what 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 uh, brought this brought brought you to us today? Great, so there's interest in the topic, OLTC program, micro certifications and improving teaching, accessible community conversation, wanting to learn more about this session because it was mentioned in class and an opportunity to learn, 
supporting the Maple League, uh, this focus on compassion, conference credit, nice. <laughs> Uh, new to teaching, enjoying the book club, aligns with research. Great, great, great to just see these as they come in, learning about campus initiatives. So there are all, there are all kinds of reasons that, that folks are with us today and it's, it's great to have you. want to include more community engagement in biology teaching and research. Great. So now you have a sense of where we're headed and I'll pass it over to my colleague, John, to just give us a little more context about community development and our program and sort of where this inquiry is is um, active for us. Okay. Thanks, Gabriel, and thanks, Neil, too, for helping organize the session. And I, I wanted to welcome everyone as well and, and shout out to the students who, who've uh, been able to, to join as well. And I, I also I want to say how grateful I am to work with the individuals that I do in that we, we take the time to con consider you know the topics that we're discussing today compassionate inter interdependence and and how do you foster uh compassionate driven actions um you know among students and with within community and and i think part of it um it comes from in part how we also frame ourselves and how we look at the world and how we approach the world uh within our program and within our individual uh, and as individuals and so you know, as as scholars moving through our, our PhDs and many of the, the faculty here experience that and we join join the programs and we contribute to knowledge and in uh, and many, many different and diverse ways. Uh, you know, and sometimes it's, it's quite applied. Sometimes it's a mix of applied where, where we find in our program in community development, by and large, many of the faculty are starting to use the term, you know, scholar practitioners to recognize the role of our, our scholarly, you know, work that we're doing. So we're, we're taking community development driven theory and knowledge and strategies around assets and resiliency framing and planning, but we're applying that in communities and we're working with our students. And then that application of it, um, you know, we're attempting to improve the lives of others uh, and increase our own understanding. And, and that's, you know, that's a goal that 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 drives, you know, the um, the colleagues that I that I work with. And so, um, earlier um, we had shared some of this presentation, a good part of it, uh, at a World Community Development Conference in in June or July. Uh, that would be Mary Gabriel and two of our students. And and I and I said at the time how honored and privileged I felt that this was important and critical enough that we would come together to wrap our head around these issues and explore them in the more depth that it deserves. Uh, you know, our program, as most of you who are familiar with, it's a four, de four degree program and we have a, a small but mighty graduate program. And what I, I guess distinguishes us from, from many other programs is our focus on, on, applied, on applied learning. and and. And we've been very intentional with how we develop these applied learning opportunities. And you know, you might have heard the word scaffolded, where you know, intentionally build on one experience to the other. And so, for example, we have a first year experience that is uh, managed through um, our first year community development course, where every year we move to a particular community where our students in small groups will interview a number of, of different groups uh, in a particular community. We work very closely with the community partner. It could be Windsor, Kentville, Berwick. We've done it as far as Digby. We've done it in Halifax Regional Mis Mis Municipality years ago. But our students working with the community partner are organized, you know, and, and um, will interview various groups, uh, faith-based groups, uh, um, municipal groups, uh, uh, racialized, disenfranchised groups, and, and try to understand what community means to them, um, what places are special or sacred to them, 
what sort of changes are they recognizing in their community? How can what we're doing to support this first year community experience can also support goals and aims of the community that we're partnering with? And, and the term was used uh, by, by Mary Sweetman not that long ago, this idea of a disorienting dilemma. And I'm sorry, Mary, if I'm stealing your thunder <laughs> and using that word, but it's a word that you, that you used when um, you described this at the last time we gave this presentation. And it's often through that first year experience where students will have that disorienting um, dilemma where what they might've seen as what a community is to them um, may look very different because through their initial experience, they, they have a different gaze. Um, you know, that, you know, while communities are, are resilient, you know, full of grace and assets and, and bundles of resiliency, they're also, you know, um, beset with inequities and poverty and environmental crisis and environmental racism. And so these are key issues that, that we tend to, that we tend to struggle with. And so, in that first year, year experience with our students, you know, they, they, you know, we peel away the layers of community, but then we rebuild these layers as well. And then, you know, through their many other applied experiences in our program, we eventually move to our fourth year experience, core term experience, which is, which is where we bring these, these pieces together, where students work more independently, work more closely with the community partner, less so with a faculty member, and they can begin to, I guess sometimes what we say is sort of actualize some of these lessons that we've been building in the first few years of the program. Uh, Gabriel, can you advance the slide, please? And so, you know, at the heart of much of the work that we've been focusing on as a faculty, and we do this um, uh, specifically, we do set aside time to, you know, to focus on, on these issues that are, are very important you know, around equity and social justice, such as decolonization, or for example, the Black Lives Matter movement and environmental justice related issues. Um, what, I, what I find is important is, is the setting of that space aside. So on Fridays, we have our graduate seminar, but we, but we join all the, we have faculty members that join that as well as community members where we, we put these on our agenda as issues that we wanna grapple with. And, and we also, you know, look to partner closely. And, and when I use the word partner, I mean, we can spend lots of time what it means to, to develop a partnership, to have a partnership. But we work very closely with partners who have some of the lived experiences that we seek to better understand so we can become a better partner. What you'll hear later on as we're talking about this is you know, we're talking about compassionate communities, but you hear words about being uncomfortable or leaning towards our learning edges. And what does it feel to be at that learning edge? And I guess what I'm discovering it personally is that I, I tend to find I'm at that learning edge when I'm grappling with these issues. You know, for example, I spent five or six years working on, on my PhD in Northern Alberta with five First Nation communities, but how does that personal experience translate to what lessons I may or may not or should share today? And, and so, you know, we are spending significant time with, with community partners, I guess, grappling with these issues um, so we can work on compassionate driven actions uh, to support, you know, interdependence in our program. Mary? Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm here with Gabriel. <laughs> uh, this is what you get for running across campus and then expecting your computer just to come on and be magical. Um, I'm Mary Seaman and my pronouns are she, her. And I also acknowledge that I am in Mi'kma'ki and that that is part of my education and actions um, on a daily basis to integrate um, indigenous ways of knowing and decolonizing my practice. I, I think, John, you just did a, a wonderful job of um, kind of going through some of the concepts and theoretical framing that will engage us in a good conversation. So I really won't take, take too much time, um, but I just wanted to you know, go back to what Gabriel said around that, that these are, we're putting together three concepts that I think we're hearing more as 
as connected, but just wanted to acknowledge that when we're talking about interdependence, what does that, what does that mean or what do we mean by that? Uh, and so in education um, theory and practice, we often go through a developmental stage of dependence to independence. And that dependence stage is usually when we are reliant on others to help us with our needs, our basic needs um, and our development. And then we move into an independent stage. Um, and often in, in Western neoliberal contexts, we focus on that stage in post-secondary. And we often um, get caught in that stage of development around career development, um, being individualistic and working towards things with a linear goal of um, our own personal self-actualization or you know, getting that career, getting the job. Um, and what a lot of scholars are now writing and talking a lot about, which is really exciting and is, is starting to really inform our practice in community development is this idea of interdependence. The idea of interdependence is that acknowledging that we are part of a bigger whole and that we are whole human beings. Um, and we like to equate it to ecosystems. And so seeing ourselves as part of the ecosystem and that if we just focus on one part of the ecosystem, then we'll often see that that ecosystem will break down or we introduce a, an invasive a species, let's say, to an ecosystem to try to combat one particular little part uh, and it has knock-on effects or ripple effects onto the whole system. And so teaching for interdependence and what we mean by that is not just teaching the whole student, but teaching the student um, and ourselves in this learning community that we wanna create together around the systems, um, communities of practice, seeing ourselves as part of a bigger whole, which, which does require um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary thought um, it, it requires us to branch into other disciplines, um, into other sectors, and bringing lots of people um, and ideas to the table. And so I think that I just wanted to, or we wanted to uh, make that connection around um, what does interdependence mean. And this is something we're all working on uh, and learning more about. So excited to hear your, your piece of it or how you engage with, with those terms. Um, so why don't I, See that we're at 12.30. So do we want to turn to the questions and I'll let Gabriel uh, read those out for us. Great. So we thought what we would just do is now that we've, we've provided these context pieces, context pieces in terms of the program and what we're doing, but then also the, the theory and, and sort of scholarly discussion of this is actually just get into the kind of practicalities of what this looks like on the ground. So. Um, we'll each, the three of us, will respond to two questions, and I'm going to group them together just so that we have time to also open this up for conversation. Mm -hmm. But just the questions to Mary and to John, and that I'm also asking myself is like, what does it practically look like in a day to day way in our classrooms or working with community to do this, to, to, to bring this to life? And secondly, when do we know we're on our learning edge? And what does that feel like? So those would be the two questions. And either of you who, who you know, John or Mary, whoever would like to begin, you're welcome to, uh, to, to kick it off. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get going. I, I, well, one thing I, I appreciate the way Neil introduced the session and, and I think, in part by doing that is that you know it, it situates us you know and it you know it brings us into this space and and I, I think you know when we move students and ourselves towards you know these these sort of compassionate learning it's also important to to acknowledge that space and 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 I guess for my own practice I, it's not that I would necessarily do that before every class but it is something that I often do before classes, because I think anyone who's teaching here can understand, you know, the fast pace of students running it out of classes. And then, so you have to be very mindful, you know, when you're, when you're working with very mindful and important topics. So I, I you know, we kind of claim, you know, and, and we talk about the space and how we want, we want to move in, in that space. Um, and, you know, I also, you know, and, and first of all, I just want to be, you know, honest too, in that this is a fairly new 
language for me. I've been teaching for 25 years, you know, over 20 years here and five years at, at Lakehead universities. And so I'm, this is new language for me. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, I think it's a good fit, you know, because I, you know, I, you know, I, because of maybe my personality, but, but when I say I'm grappling with it, I am grappling with it because it is, it's, it's new language. And what's very interesting about it is that these are things that I care deeply about whether I'm teaching or not, but I'm finding that these are things that our students care very deeply about as well. And I find that if we don't grapple with, I guess, uncomfortable issues, whether it's issues around decolonization, equity, or racism or environmental racism or ecological grief, these are the sort of questions that are being asked by, by the students in my classes who want to explore these. Um, you know, then, then, you know, I need to be able to create space for that. And I, I, I'm gonna pass it over to Mary in a second, but there's a woman named Karen Armstrong, the founder of, of, of the, the Charter for Compassion. She's done some amazing work on supporting this idea of a compassionate community. And she says a compassionate city is an uncomfortable city. You know, it's a city, um, an uncomfortable city is where anyone is homeless or hungry or, every, or if a child's not loved or given rich opportunities to grow, um, or if we don't treat our neighbors as we would wish to be treated. And so how do we take that and, and move that into compassionate driven actions? And I guess that's what we discuss in the types of courses, sustainable community development, global issues. How can we, how can we take these actions, with, whether it's doing interviews or projects or supporting grant writing in various classes or strategic planning? Um, Mary, I, I, I could say more, but I want to make sure I'm sharing the space. So. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful, John. Um, I think so, just to give some practical context to some of those um, concepts, something that uh, we do or that we practice is doing intake, um, intake forms with students. Uh, so in my first year class, I have students fill out something that they're handing in within the first couple of days of class that allows them to um, let me know about uh, things that they might not feel comfortable talking about in front of the whole class or even coming and talking to me if they just met me um, that would help negotiate that space. So having the ability to, um, uh, you know, tell me some of their needs outside of the context of the syllabus or the classroom in order to better facilitate. So whether they might come late sometimes because they have childcare issues or whether they're trying to, um, whether they're on academic probation and they you know, want me to know that, only me to know that so that I can keep track of them or that they need help with deadlines and all that kind of stuff. So I think um, having incorporating universal design as much as possible and universal design of learning within our courses and in our syllabi um, are just some practical ways that I think teach through compassion, through a lens of compassion. Um, and then interdependence, I, I think practically just again, some examples are trying to open up the classroom. And so believing that community engaged learning, uh, whether that's bringing community to the classroom or going out into community will really um, enrich those spaces for interdependence. And I, what I try to do and what I try to practice and I'm always learning is um, modeling those relationships. So uh, for example, we just had the volunteer coordinator of the farmer's market into class on, on Tuesday for my first year class. And um, it, you know, she gave us the context of why the market is so important. We're gonna go and volunteer at the market doing some sort of mundane things but actually it's part of a much bigger picture of sustainable food systems and, and caring for local farmers in our communities. And so my, our students, my class, I get to be part of that bigger system. And so modeling those ways of how to connect into something greater and bigger. Like, I think if we just talk about these things and talk about the concepts of whether it's food systems or poverty in our classes, but we're not actually living it or seeing it or, or seeing ourselves as citizens of these issues, then we're not actually going to be able to under to really grapple with them outside. Um, they, they just become concepts and we start to other. Um, and so those are just some, some ways that we try to do those in our classes. I'd love to, I think there's some students from my class actually on. There are, there are, there are some, there are definitely, <laughs> are we doing what we are say we, we do? Keep us honest, everyone. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I so partly my perspective um, is that I was I'm trained as a professional facilitator and uh, and uh, and really in that work leading up to my doctoral research. And so for me, um, I really value process in the classroom um, as a way of trying to loosen some of that, you know, the sort of quite linear individualistic, like I'm here for good grades. Um, and not that that isn't important and that I'll support that. Of course, the kind of rigor of, of academic inquiry and um, accomplishment is there, but also how can we kind of loosen the edges to look up and really see each other um, and build relationships. So I do a lot of moving people around in my classrooms of, 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 of doing my best to create spontaneous new potential connections between students. So I do a lot of community building in my classrooms. And I do a lot of community building when I'm working in community in that way too. I take a lot of time to just build these micro connections between people that create a sense of of community that that is stronger than all of those connections. Um, and there's something then that I find if I'm stepping into a leadership role in community or I'm, I'm at the front of the classroom that I can kind of rest in like, actually they're all doing this work now together or relational work. And so then also for me, that looks like assessment that includes the process say of group work. Um, so not only do I care about the outcome, the program that they run in a community, but I really wanna hear about how that process felt. What did they learn about themselves and their leadership? What did they learn about themselves and their desire for control? Or um, what did it look like to encounter their own procrastination, but also be responsible to each other? And, and so really kind of creating space for those kinds of conversations um, so for me, there's really kind of those process pieces that feel really important. And then I would say for me, this kind of like, when am I on a learning edge? I, I was re-looking at um, Kevin Gannon's Radical Hope, a teaching manifesto over the last couple of days, which is an excellent book for, for educators and, and students as well, I think, to understand um, some, you know, to in, investigate some really great ideas that align with this. And I know the Maple League has, has brought Kevin in to speak. Um, but he, he writes and he's, he's bringing in um, two scholars, Collier and Ross, but he says that it's important for us as teachers and professors that none of us, either we or our students, are fully formed intellects. And we should embrace the reality that learning is always and already a process of becoming. Um, and I think it's like we're also always becoming human beings responding to this moment. The, you know, the global context right now feels incredibly personal. How do we make space for that in our conversations and in our classrooms and this idea of that we're becoming. And so, you know, for instance, today, um, I told a vulnerable story in my first year class and I could kind of feel it in like my throat caught. And it was one of those moments of like, am I, am I gonna tell this story? They don't know me that well yet. I don't know them. Um, and, and, and doing it anyway, you know? And it was, it, was, it was something that I had processed and it's an easy story to tell on some level, but it also felt quite personal and exposed. And there's something, um, for me of kind of continually turning toward that, of not just appearing as the fully formed scholar, intellectual, but also a person who is in her own process of, of becoming and unpacking and responding and navigating and grappling with the world. Um, so those are some thoughts uh, for us. I think just to, you know, of course, this conversation in many ways, like the three of us are in regularly together and then we hear new layers today, um, but we'd love to just open it up. Did anything provoke you, interest you, irritate you?